Now, for more on the nuclear talks in Geneva, we're joined live by John Limbert, former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Iran. He was also one of the diplomats held hostage in the U.S. Embassy in Tehran over 30 years ago. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you are the, the highest ranking diplomat. You're welcome. Thank you. Dealing solely with Iranian issues. The highest ranking, you, you've got, uh, you know, tons of expertise in this area. Do you actually see a chance for a deal to be reached? Um, I, I do, but it's going to take time and it's going to take it's going to take lots of patience. The rule on these things is always uh, whatever you're going to do, it's going to take longer than you think um, and it's going to be harder than you think. Well, you know, we're talking about many years of hostility, 30 plus of very little other than uh, insults. You've likened diplomacy between the two countries as uh, the land of Narnia, always winter never Christmas. If no agreement is reached uh, in a reset, do, do you, if no agreement is reached, can a reset of these relations even be possible? Well, uh, I think what everybody needs to do is uh, take a deep breath, uh, step back a few steps, and look at where we and the Iranians are compared to we, where we were uh, four or five months ago. Uh, for 34 years, as you as you noted, uh, we and the Iranians did nothing but uh, trade insults and, th and threats with each other. Now we're talking we're talking seriously. This this is a major achievement, a positive achievement. Uh, but uh, reaching an agreement at the end of the day means putting aside all of that hostility, all of that suspicion. Uh, because lurking in the background is this idea that if I say yes to what they propose, uh, maybe, just maybe, I'm being cheated. Okay, so referencing that idea lurking in the background, you know, despite international efforts to strike this deal, a lot of chest pounding going on in Washington talking about uh, possibly threatening new sanctions against Iran. Does this threaten the thaw in the relations between these two countries? Uh, of, of course, you're going. You you have the you have uh, people on both sides who, for whatever reason, are going to pro, uh, are going to oppose any change in the status quo. The status quo, uh, whatever else you say about it, it's comfortable, it's familiar. Now, my own view is it doesn't serve the interest of uh, either side in uh, in this dispute and should be changed and and is changing but it's there there is going to be resistance that on our side uh, is up that is the that's the job of the president and the administration to lead a change which is clearly in the, is going to be in the national interest well the president and the administration aside if a deal is reached will lawmakers in washington still pursue sanctions do you think Uh, that's a good. That's a. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, they can, of course, they can. Uh, sanctions resolutions have an unfortunate history, uh, not just against Iran, but generally. If they come to a vo uh, uh, if they come to a vote, uh, they usually get overwhelming overwhelming support. Uh, the question is, uh, does the president, does the does the uh, executive, does the executive branch uh, have the flexibility, have the option? to uh, pursue them um, 100 percent, 50 percent, 25 percent, or not at all. Remember, uh, I believe that sanctions against the former Soviet, or against the for former Soviet Union uh, stayed in place sometimes as much as 20 years uh, after the former Soviet Union disappeared. That's a very good point. Uh, in your opinion, have the international sanctions in this case proven effective uh, against Tehran? Uh, that's a good question. It, it, it's a question of what is effective. I've heard people say uh, that, quote, the sanctions worked because we're seeing a different diplomatic approach from, Te uh, from Tehran. Uh, in, in logic, you have to, you have to distinguish be between what you know to be true and what you wish to be true. And this is a case of, I think, people wishing it to be true and then making it true. Yes, the Iranian economy is in bad shape. That's true. Is it because of the sanctions? Maybe, but we really don't know. I've never seen any evidence of it, and there's strong indications that there are other factors, particularly economic mismanagement, uh, that have led to the economic problems that uh, undoubtedly exist. Okay, well, let's take it from the French angle. France was accused of blocking the deal by introducing new conditions. Do you think Paris could actually soften its stance this time? 
uh, there, uh, uh, there, I'm, I'm going to take the uh, the diplomatic way out and say <laughs> you really have to talk to uh, have to talk to the French the French about this. Um, I think, but speaking of the French, I mean, wasn't it Napoleon who said, uh, "May all my enemies be coalitions"? Uh, coalitions <laughs> are notoriously difficult to deal with and notoriously difficult to keep together. <laughs> We will try to give France a call in that case and get them on the phone, see, see what they've got to say on this then. Let's talk about Israel. <laughs> Israel is strongly uh, opposed to the current deal. If the consensus is reached in this case, how likely is it to disrupt the ties between Israel and the U.S.? Uh, I don't think I don't at the end of the day I don't think it's going to that's that's a that's a strong relationship it's a it's a long and very uh, and and very deep relationship uh, I as I understand it what my uh, Israeli friends tell me is within Israel itself there's a lot of controversy over the issue of Iran and what should Israeli what should the Israeli stand be and some of the more uh, extreme stands that are com that coming out which oppose any um, any deal um, are creating concern in uh, concern in Israel. A lot of people are, have been criticizing the prime minister. Look, what what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu seems to be uh, asking for is not a negotiated deal, uh, but in fact um, an Iranian surrender, where they are pressured into simply give, uh, giving up. Well, that's that's not a negotiation. That's a, that's a surrender. And if you get, if you do squeeze somebody so hard that they surrender, such an, such an agreement simply isn't going to last. Both sides have to feel, have to uh, believe that they got something out of the negotiated deal. Okay, so uh, aside from these one on one relationships between Iran and, and other countries, how will the outcome of these talks impact the international community's relations with Iran, do you think? Uh, well, it, it's been um, it's been uh, back and forth between Iran and the international community um, for about for 34 years. Iran has seemed to lurch from one extreme to the other. At one point, it talks about uh, being part of the international community. It wants to join the international community, and then it goes out and does something such as uh, overrun an embassy, whether it's the U.S. embassy in '79 or more recently the British uh, 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 the British embassy, uh, that calls that intention into question. Uh, what we've seen, I think, in the last uh, three or four months uh, since the election of President uh, of President Rouhani and since some of the statements of the of the Supreme Leader. Uh, is, um, I think, a, a, a change of direction and a serious change of direction in terms of joining the international community. Because mm -hmm. when Iran talks, uh, you know, puts up the brave front about not needing the international community, in fact, I think after 34 years, they, fa they find that, uh, that they, in fact, they do. All right. We'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much for joining us. John Limbert, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Iran.